Okay, so hi and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for our webinar today. Um, my name is Zara McBrady and I am the marketing executive here at Heuristics. Today we are presenting statistical analysis of prognostic biomarkers in personalized medicine presented by Bernard North, statistical consultant and application specialist at Exploristics. So first of all, we're just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box in your control panel. These questions will then be answered at the end of the webinar. And also please just be aware that others can see the questions um, that you've asked. So um, let me just give you a little bit of background on Exploristics um, and what we do. Founded in 2009, Exploristics is a statistical analysis consultancy that uses advanced analytical methods to help our clients extract the most information from a wide range of data sources. Exploristics team is largely made up of statisticians and programmers. We work successfully with a range of clients from the animal health, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, diagnostics, and medical device industry. Our team boasts extensive experience in clinical research, statistics, modeling, data management, GCP, and diagnostic development, with specific expertise in the clinical and animal healthcare applications to include safety analysis, bioequivalence, pharmacogenomics, and biomarkers. So now, without further ado, I am going to pass you over to Bernard North, who will begin the presentation. Thank you, Zara. As Zara said, we will be looking at established and newer methods for assessing prognostic biomarker models. So first of all, what are biomarkers? You can see on your screen the NIH definition of a biomarker, essentially a substance or attribute we can measure that will tell us something about a person's health, whether they are sick or healthy, likely to become sick, or whether they are likely to respond well to treatment. Examples of classical biomarkers are blood pressure or pulse, or biological molecules that can be measured in a body fluid such as blood or urine. For example, prostate-specific antigen, PSA, a biomarker relevant in prostate cancer. But for the last few 10 or 15 years, I've seen newer biomarkers such as genetic or proteomic measures that make appropriate analysis of biomarkers quite a buzzy area. Often the biomarker informs healthcare when simply used as the measurement of its abundance, but sometimes it is supplied with an informative cutoff or is simply evaluated as a presence or absence of the biomarker. Biomarkers are often described as being of three types depending on purpose. For example, diagnostic biomarkers tell us if a person is likely to have a particular disease or not. For example, raised prostate-specific antigen, PSA, can indicate presence of prostate cancer, and serum troponin levels are used to diagnose heart attacks. Predictive biomarkers predict how patients respond to particular treatments, e.g. breast cancer patients who are HER2 positive have large numbers of HER2 growth factor protein receptors on their breast cells and can be treated by Herceptin that blocks these receptors' ability to receive growth signals. Predictive biomarkers are central in personalized medicine. Prognosis is predicting the clinical course of a disease, predicting future disease events, whereas diagnosis is current disease status. Prognostic biomarkers, the subject of this talk, predict future disease outcomes, but in a more general sense than predictive biomarkers, identifying patients at higher risk irrespective of treatment. This next slide gives more detail on prognostic biomarkers. Typically, they are measured before treatment for patients who are untreated or receiving standard treatment and are associated with disease outcome, for example, death, recurrence, or earlier death. They can identify patients at higher risk, allowing such patients to be treated more intensively, so-called risk stratification, or can encourage lifestyle changes. Perhaps the biomarker can suggest a drug target. For example, high levels of matrix metalloproteinases, MMPs, 
are now associated with worst outcome in ischemic stroke. That's both in recovery and a recurrent stroke. And this may lead to novel treatments. Other examples include oncotype DX, a combination of genetic measures predicting disease recurrence in breast cancer patients, and the Euroscore calculator that weights risk factors such as age, gender, previous surgery, to predict death after cardiac operations. Prognostic models, sometimes called risk models, risk scores, or prediction models, combine the effect of multiple candidate biomarkers and other potentially prognostic variables, such as gender, age, medical history, to predict disease outcome. The data is often collected from a prospective cohort study, where a group of subjects or patients are followed in time, having had their biomarkers and other characteristics measured at baseline, and sometimes also during the follow-up. This is often regarded as the best approach, though other approaches, such as retrospective cohort studies, using existing data collected for other purposes, are possible. Often the response is a binary response, e.g. the occurrence of an event such as death from disease. Binary responses are the main subject of this talk, but the outcome can also be a survival time, for example, the time until an event such as death, and similar methods apply. Logistic regression is a standard technique to combine multiple biomarkers and other risk factors to predict a binary outcome. We want to find a subset of K biomarkers or prognostic variables, X1 to XK, whose weighted combination gives the best prediction of an event. Here, the biomarker variables are X and the weights B, and logistic, and logistic regression finds the best subset and, and the best predicted weight estimates to reflect our data. And the equation shown guarantees that the predicted probabilities are between 0 and, 0 and 1. The equation also shows that positive weights, values of B, for biomarker X, indicate that larger values of the biomarker, e.g. larger tumor size, are associated with higher risk predictions. We can take XB, the exponent of B for a particular biomarker, to be the odds ratio estimate for a unit change in the biomarker. For example, the increase in the odds of prostate cancer for each unit increase in PSA level. There are a number of important issues in prognostic model development not dealt with in this webinar. We can't cover everything, but are listed here for context. Briefly, issues in variable selection and model selection and development, sufficient sample size driven by the number of events, model fit assessment, it's the implementation of prognostic models via graphical tools such as nomograms or by apps, and the various recent standards, tripod and rigor, that advise on reporting model development and validation. This slide sets out the main agenda for the webinar. Prognostic models can be assessed via four perspectives. Discrimination is correctly distinguishing those with and without the event assessed by rock curves, and the well-known sensitive and specificity based on the cutoff from the prediction equation. Discrimination is very important for diagnostic biomarkers, but for prognosis, although it remains important, other issues are relevant too. Calibration asks, are individual, are individual predictions accurate? I.e., for those with a 20% risk from a well-calibrated model, we would expect 20% to actually have an event. This can be assessed by a Briar score, the holmes lemerteau tests, and calibration curves. The researcher Nancy Cook clarified the difference between discrimination and calibration with an artificial example or thought experiment. A prognostic model is applied to some patients, and some are given a prediction of 51% of death within one year, say. The others are predicted 49%. It turns out all those predicted 51% actually do die. Those predicted 49% all live. So there's perfect discrimination. Using a cutoff of 50%, we can correctly identify who lives and who dies. But is the model well calibrated? Would it not be better if those predicted to die had predictions closer to 100%, not 51%, given they all did die? And those who lived, predictions closer to 0%. Typically, a widespread of predictions is one indicator of a well-calibrated model. 
In our third part, we review reclassification methods for assessing if a new biomarker adds predictive information to an existing model or group of predictors, or more generally, to compare two prognostic models. Finally, we consider net benefit and decision curves to assess how useful models are to an individual patient who needs to make a decision, for example, whether to have surgery or not. Throughout this webinar, we will be illustrating methods with a testicular cancer data set first analyzed by Professor Ewart Steyerberg for the REHIT study group in 1995. Professor Steyerberg is another important researcher in prognostic model analysis and has used this classic data set to illustrate prognostic model methods in a number of papers. Testicular cancer patients are treated with cisplatin chemotherapy. After chemotherapy, surgical resection is generally carried out to remove remnants of the initial metastases, but resection itself has some morbidity and mortality. We want to predict which patients have this residual tumour and which can safely avoid this surgery. We have five key predictor variables. A binary variable for the occurrence of a tissue type called teratoma. Two more binary variables indicating elevated tumour markers pre-chemotherapy alpha-fetoprotein, AFP, and human chorionic gonadotrophin, HCG. And also we have the size and the reduction in size of the original tumour mass. We also have another tumour marker, namely scaled lactate dehydrogenase, whose log transform value we use as an additional sixth variable. We show the odds ratios and p-values for each variable in what I call the five variable model in the table. Teratoma is significant, as are the two markers. The post-chemo tumour size is not significant. But the reduction is very significant with large reductions protective, odds ratios less than one. Remember, as with any analysis, it is useful to do summaries of the data beforehand. As a quick visualisation, we can see a histogram of predictions from the five variable model for those with and without residual tumour, cases and controls, we can call them. Those with tumour, the cases on the lower histogram, do have higher predictions, as you'd hope, and the proportion above an arbitrary cutoff of 60% are shown in red, with the proportion above the cutoff being the sensitivity, here 68%. And the controls below 60% on the top histogram are in blue. So a proportion of 80% of controls, known as the specificity, were below the cutoff. Receiver operating characteristic curves. These plots assess the discriminatory ability of a biomarker or model by plotting the sensitivity versus one minus specificity for all cutoffs. It can be applied to individual biomarkers all the predictions from a joint model of a number of biomarkers and other predictors. The area under the rock curve, called the AUC or C statistic, measures the separability of cases and controls. If a biomarker, or the predictions from a model, are totally uninformative, the rock curve lies on the 45 degree diagonal. This means that for any cutoff, the proportion of cases and controls exceeding the cutoff are the same. The biomarker has the same description in cases and controls and is uninformative. The AUC, or C statistic, is also the probability that a random case has a higher prediction than a random control, so-called concordance. We can now see the rock curve for our five variable model produced by the rock R package in R. It shows the diagonal an uninformative marker or prediction would lie on, and the rock curve itself is colored according to the key the coloured bar on the right. The one minus specificity, or false positive rate, is on the x-axis, and the sensitivity, or true positive rate, on the y-axis. We see the bottom near the origin. The curve is coloured red-orangish. The key, the coloured bar, shows that this part of the curve corresponds to predictions around 90%. It's the top of the bar. So if we require our prediction to be 90% to 
before we predict tumour, then our sensitivity is low, around 0 to 20 percent. But the specificity is high, 100 percent. So one minus specificity, around 0 percent. I.e., with such a high bar, we lack the sensitivity to spot our cases, but we are at least specific. We have virtually zero false positives. As we lower the cutoff, the curve moves up to the right and changes colour according to the key, with more cases being correctly classified, but also with an increased, but lower, increase in false positives, controls by the cutoff being misdiagnosed as controls. So it has cases. Now, a perfect model would have a cutoff with 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity, and would be the point at the top left corner. Often a rock curve is used to obtain an optimal cutoff, and there are two automatic approaches. The cutoff is chosen where a point is closest to the top left hand corner. This is closest to perfect. Or the point is chosen with the largest distance downwards to the uninformative diagonal. This is furthest from rubbish. This latter is the preferred measure, measure the so called Uden index. However, the best cutoff really depends on the relative cost of a missed case or control, and the decision curve discussion later is relevant here. Now we move to measures of calibration. An initial measure is an r squared analog to linear regression, of which one example given is by Nagel Kirky. Next, the Breyer score is a classical prediction measure totaling over individuals the difference between the observed binary outcome, scored as 0 to 1, and the prediction, with a good model having a small score, i.e. those with events scored as 1, having a prediction, say, of 0.99, etc. However, its value also depends on the actual prevalence or proportion of cases P. So a scaled Breyer score, which is then deducted from 100%, is more commonly used, where closer to 100% means a better model. We show these metrics for the five variable model calculated by Professor Frank Harrell's R package RMS. The 30% for the scaled priors is typical. We also show the AUC and for completeness, a scaled version called DXY, Summers D, produced by the package. We now discuss a calibration test called the hosman lemershow test. Now, for the risk subset of those with a prediction of 20%, we would like 20% to actually have an event, etc. And this is called calibration in the small, meaning each risk, risk subset has the correct event rate. This can be assessed with a basic test called the hosman lemershow test that sorts our patients by risk estimate and then divides them into groups, e.g. the 10th with the highest risk predictions, the next tenth with the next highest risk predictions, down to the tenth with the lowest risks. In each group, we compare the actual number with the event in that group with the predicted number based on totaling the risks in each subset, i.e. if for, say, 100 patients in the highest risk tenth all, of all have estimates of 90%, we'd expect 90 to have the event. The total differences are compared by a chi-squared test. This test is, however, often discouraged as it lacks power to spot true miscalibration. A more advanced approach is where we try to predict the observed outcomes actually using the predictions in a regression. The outcomes are binary, so are often smooth, e.g. by LOES, to give averages of the event rate over risk intervals for a visual inspection. Code from Professor Sabo's clinical predictions model website produces the plot that illustrates this. A perfect calibration between predicted and observed would suggest an intercept of zero and a slope of one. In the plot, this is the dotted diagonal line on the plot denoted ideal, alongside the smooth plot of actual observed events versus predictions from our model, denoted non-parametric. The smooth plot of our predictions is reasonably close to the perfect line. The, the proportion of events from the Hosman-Lemershow test 
are also shown as triangles for each tenth of the risk predictions and can be compared with the previous table to show they agree. And finally, a table of metrics is also shown. A variant of this approach is logistic regression or logistic recalibration using the weighted sum of the biomarkers or predictors, the prognostic index, to predict the actual binary ob observations. The logit shown is the log odds of the probability of an event. If the estimated slope of the, log of the logistic model B is less than one, this is an indication of overfitting. Described later, but it briefly means the predictions are too good on our current data and won't predict well on new data. If we, intercept, if we estimate the uh, intercept A while fixing the slope B to be one, this is called using an offset, the estimated intercept indicates if the predictions are overall too high or too low relative to the actual prevalence. This is called calibration in the large. A simpler way to assess the predictive ability of a prognostic model is by producing a two by two table of predicted versus actual outcomes. This is called the confusion matrix. We can predict a patient as a case if his or her predicted risk from a model is greater than say 50% or 60%. Here, the confusion matrix for the five variable testicular cancer data with a 20% cutoff is shown. 284 cases and 181 controls have their tumor status predicted correctly. Now this is likely to be less when applied to new data as the estimates were calculated from this so-called training data of 544 patients and are likely to be fine-tuned to this data set. The difference in prediction when applied to new data we call the optimism or optimism bias and it will also make our estimates of discrimination and calibration over optimistic relative to the performance on new data. This is often called overfitting or modeling noise, whereby chance effects in the training data reflect in the model estimates. So we know that our so-called original estimates of discrimination and calibration on the training data are over optimistic. We would like to know how well the methods would perform on a wider population of patients similar to the training data, which is a subset of this population. One method is bootstrapping. Bootstrapping mimics the original sampling of our sample from the wider population by taking samples or resamples from our sample data with replacement. So in some bootstrap samples, some patients occur multiple times, others will not occur at all. For each bootstrap sample, we refit our model and obtain bootstrap prediction measures using the model on the bootstrap resample itself. We then apply the bootstrap model to the original sample. It will likely have lower prediction compared to that in the bootstrap sample as it wasn't fitted in the original sample. We note the difference in prediction as an estimate of optimism and repeat for each bootstrap sample. Each time applying the bootstrap model estimated from the bootstrap resample to the bootstrap sample itself and to the original data noting the difference to obtain an overall optimism estimate. We then adjust the original estimates of discrimination and calibration, the apparent estimates, to obtain optimism corrected estimates. We see in this table our original estimates of the metrics in the first column for the five variable model. The average metrics from the bootstrap samples are in the second column. And when these individual bootstrap models are applied to the original sample of 544 patients, we obtain the values in the third column. We can see they are worse, but AUC a decrease from 0.821 to 0.815. This difference is the estimate of optimism, i.e. 0 0.006, and is used to adjust the original AUC of 0.818 down to 0.812 in the final column. External validation, also called transportability, is a second important validation stage. This is to check the model equation on a different population to that used to create the model. 
This isn't necessary as the model will be applied to populations that may differ slightly from the training data. We apply the five variable model estimates to a different data set of testicular cancer patients. 273 patients from Indiana University. The prediction metrics are predictably worse than the validation data set, with the AUC reduced to 0.785. We now turn to our third issue, assessing the additional prediction of a novel biomarker when added to an existing set of biomarkers or risk factors, or in general, the comparison of two different prediction equations. We will illustrate this by assessing the additional prediction of the log-transformed tumor marker lactate dehydrogenase, LNLD HST, when added to the five variables in the model discussed up to now. In the table, we, uh, we fit all six predictors, and we see that lactate dehydrogenase has a small p-value and an odds ratio much less than one. This is the odds ratio shown in the, in the reduction in the odds of tumour per unit increase in log lactate dehydrogenase, an odds ratio of one, of course, meaning no effect. Remember, this is scale dependent, and as this variable is log transformed, a unit increase in the log scale might cover a large range of the data. Often we might scale a continuous predictor to have unit variance. So this new variable is significant. But is that enough to say it improves prediction? An obvious approach is to look at the change in our prediction metrics on adding a new biomarker. The change in AUC or IAUC is often used together with its p-value. But the change is often minimal, even the additional biomarker has a large odds ratio and or a small p-value, particularly if the original model already had a high AUC. For example, with lactate dehydrogenase, the increase in AUC was from 0.818 to 0.839, and this seems a small increase. So, does the low IAUC mean that these novel biomarkers are not useful? Or does it mean the assessment methods are inadequate? AUC, for example, is rank-based and is more important for discrimination, not prediction or prognosis. Does a novel biomarker with a small IAUC really make no difference? Now, there are often established risk categories, e.g. 5 to 10 percent. For example, in the UK, often statins are suggested if a person's 10-year risk of heart attack is above 10 percent. So, can a novel biomarker, even with a small IAUC, still change a patient's risk category in this sense, in which case it does make a difference? Nancy Crook asked this question in a 2007 paper. She considered a different data set to our testicular cancer example, namely data from the Women's Health Study. She added HDL to a model with established risk factors for 10-year cardiovascular risk, uh, blood pressure, LDL, smoking, etc., and produced what she called a reclassification table, showing the predictions with and without HDL divided into risk categories. The change in AUC is only from 0.77 to 0.78, but let's look at the table. We see in row one, denoted 0 to 5 percent, those patients whose risk without HDL was less than 5 percent. However, 696 of those patients have their estimate increased to the 5 to 10 percent group when HDL is considered. These patients who are reclassified up are in red. For those in the 5 to 10 percent group without HDL, we see that even more, 34 percent, are reclassified. Some upwards, 291, presumably those with bad HDL, and some downwards, 593. Okay, so the new biomarker can change prediction relative to risk categories, at least in this case. Does the new prediction equation with the new biomarker improve prediction? This depends whether those reclassified up or down are cases or controls. A requirement is for metrics to assess if new biomarkers improve prediction. So if a new biomarker gives a patient a higher risk estimate, this is good if the patient actually does turn out to have the event. And the reverse for controls. For this reason, Michael Pencina in 2008 
suggested separate reclassification tables for cases and controls. And we present these for the, for the testicular cancer data. So increased risk category reclassification with a new biomarker indicates better prediction with a new model for cases, but it's the reverse for controls. Lower predictions and reclassification down are better for these. In our testicular cancer data, using 20% as a clinically important cutoff between low and high risk, we see in the first table for the controls, those without tumour, that 15 in red went from low to high risk, a worse prediction, and 16 from high to low, a better prediction. We call that a net improvement of one. With cases, it works the other way. Eight improved or increased their predictions, and three worsened or decreased, a net improvement of five. On this basis, Michael Pencina defined reclassification metrics such as the net reclassification index as the net gain in cases we've described as a proportion of cases and similarly for controls and an overall NRI as the total. He also defined the category list NRI where a patient is counted as reclassified at higher risk simply if their prediction as a percent increases with a new biomarker. This is different to the previous NRI, where only patients who cross cutoffs are counted. With categories NRI, all patients will either increase or decrease, unless the new biomarker has no effect and a zero weight, meaning estimates with and without are exactly the same, and this is unlikely. The final reclassification metric is the Integrated Discrimination Improvement, or IDI, which is the increase in the prediction for cases as for cases, an increased prediction is good, minus the increase in prediction for controls. So, the original NRI is based on patients changing risk category. The categories NRI defines each, pa each patient as either increasing or decreasing, and the IDI looks at the actual differences in predictions. By plugging into the NRI equation, the numbers in the previous tables shown reclassified across the 20% cutoff, we obtain an NOI of 0.02 with a non-significant p-value. So although 8% of the 544 patients were reclassified, the net gain from reclassification was only 2%. The category of this NOI comes from a cross-tabulation of those who increase or not versus their case control status. We see in the top table, the, its last column, the cases, that 64.9% of cases increased their prediction with lactate dehydrogenase, the right direction, versus 35.1% who decrease. And for 51.4% of controls decrease appropriately versus 48.6% who increase, giving a net increase of 32.6%. And this is significant. The IDI looks at the actual increase in predictions in cases plus the average decrease in controls. Using these figures in the bottom table for the two prediction models, we plug into the equation to obtain a value of 0.039, which is significant. Some of these metrics are, have quite small values, and this can be typical, possibly indicating the original model was quite good, with the new, newer model still offering a small amount of improvement. Reclassification metrics are now widely used, so it's useful in my opinion to know what they are. However, they have been criticised. For example, in 2013, Hilden and Gerhard wrote a paper stating that IDI and NOI can be subverted by misspecified, poorly calibrated models, or for that matter, by outright cheating, i.e. by constructing exaggerated models. They illustrate this by giving this artificial example shown in the table. We have three columns for three biomarker groups, e.g. low, medium and high, with their proportions in the first row of 50%, 30% and 20%. The event rate is 30%, 60% and 80%. We have two models to compare. First, a perfect model with exactly the right predicted, models, exactly the right predicted rates for the three groups. 
we compare it with an exaggerated model, which assigns 0% prediction to the first low risk group and 100% to the other groups. The details at the bottom of this slide show that the exaggerated model has a substantial increase in IDI and categorized NOI compared to the perfect model, even though it should be worse. Now, this data is slightly artificial, but there is an important message here made by the authors, namely that it's important to apply these metrics only to models that have been shown to be well calibrated. We have considered several aspects of predictive ability of models and comparison of predictions and models. However, how can an individual who needs to make a decision, such as whether to have surgery, actually use these models? For example, our testicular patients, given an estimate of their risk of residual cancer from either model, need to decide whether to have a resection or not. If their risk is 99%, they probably would go for surgery. If 1%, then probably not. Where is the break-even point? It would depend on their fear of cancer versus aversion to surgery. We can show how these two factors specify a cutoff, and then how we can use decision curves to investigate the estimated utility of a range of cutoffs for our two prognostic models based on our actual data. So we can define the benefit of resection to a patient who turns out to actually have tumor as B, and the cost of resection to a patient who doesn't have tumor as C. And we suggest those with a predictive risk cutoff R, say 20%, get a resection. So with the prediction proportion of cases, those with cancer as P, based on the cutoff R, we can define a net benefit as a total benefit over our patients minus the total cost. And we can express it in the first equation at the bottom, bottom of the slide. So we calculate the total benefit and the total cost. The benefit, we say, of the proportion P who are cases, the true positive rate or sensitivity, TPR, will have estimated risk exceeding R and be recommended or opt for the intervention and receive the expected benefit B. So in the equation at the bottom, we multiply these three terms to get the total benefit. Of the proportion one minus P, of controls, a false positive rate, or one minus specificity, will also unfortunately have an estimated risk of CDNR and be recommended the intervention and incur the co expected cost C. We deduct this total cost and the total benefit to get the expected net benefit. And then we can take out B as a factor from the expected net benefit equation to express the net benefit of the policy in units of B in the bottom equation. Next, we show we can express B or C in terms of an in indifference cutoff. Is 20% the threshold risk probability where expected benefit equals expected cost? If I'm undecided whether I have a resection or not, when told my risk is BT equals 20%, then that means that 20% is my indifference cutoff, and it's related to my relative view of benefit and cost. So for the indifference cutoff PT, then my expected benefit is PT times B and is equal to my expected cost, 1 minus PT times C, i.e., if 20%, then I think a 20% chance of B is equal to an 80% chance of C. And the equation in the slide shows this math mathematically and rearranges it to get give the relation between cutoff PT and C and B, i.e. PT over 1 minus PT equals C over B. So having expressed the cutoff in terms of B and C, we can now do two things. We can express the equation for net benefit that included the term C over B in terms of potential cutoffs. We can take a possible cutoff, e.g. 20%, and plug into our net benefit equation the actual true positive rate and false positive rate and the proportion of cases from applying each prediction model with and without lactic dehydrogenase to our data, as we've already done. And we show this in our reclassification tables to help us do this with PT initially as 
So the equation at the bottom, we express the net benefit equation for the actual numbers of true and false positives and total numbers. And we can show the net benefit at PT was 20% for each model, i.e. the case when the predictions that are compared to 20% are derived from the model without lactate dehydrogenase, we see the net benefit is 0.439. And for predictions derived from the model with lactate dehydrogenase, we have 0.448. We see this by putting for no LDH, um, the true and false positives of 0 0.289 and 180. And for, and for when, when we do have um, LDH, we have 289 and 180. Additionally, we also show the benefit for all patients getting the resection. Andrew Vickers introduced the idea of decision curves, whereby the benefit of several prognostic models are compared across a range of benefit cost cutoffs PT. This plot was produced by Dr. Vickers Co. from the MSKCC website. The net benefit is shown for a range of cutoffs using prediction for the model without lactate dehydrogenase as a solid line and with lactate dehydrogenase as dashed and the true and false positive rates of the two models in our data. The resection in all patient line is also shown. It shows that for intermediate cutoffs, 30 to 80 percent, higher benefit can be obtained by using the model with lactate dehydrogenase, as the dashed line is just above the solid. This was also shown for the net benefit calculation for 20 percent in the previous slide. So this shows how decision curves can guide a patient with a certain cost-benefit cutoff as to which prediction model he should use to base his decision regarding surgery. Okay, we've covered all the aspects I wanted to discuss today. I think that when assessing the prognostic model, it is useful to look at all these aspects simultaneously and not focus on one aspect of model prediction or utility. I hope the talk has been useful. Thank you for listening. Okay, so thank you, Bernard, for that. Um, that was a brilliant presentation. Um, I think we've got a couple of questions in, so we're going to go ahead and take a bit of time just to answer them. Um, so our first question um, came from Andrew, and it's, what is the difference between the tripod and rigor guidelines? Oh, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, there are a lot of similarities. I mean, I should say that tripod seems to be much more widely known and cited. I mean, partly, but not totally, because it's an earlier publication. Um, they are very similar in their checklists. E.g., they specify, you know, you've got to say the objective, you've got to describe your patients and the predictors, um, how the model was developed. Um, tripod also has a very large elaboration paper by Carol Moons, which goes into much more detail than just the checklist. It's actually a very large paper. I have noticed two differences. Um, tripod is very, regards it as very important to specify whether the, the paper you're, report, you're reporting your model deals with model development or validation or, or both. Um, I mean, the, the rigor paper is important. Um, it's different, that's a lot shorter. But one thing about that I find interesting is it has a lot of detail on describing optimism bias and how that was treated in the paper. So I, I find that quite interesting too. But it's it's much less cited at the moment and used, I suppose that means. But thanks for the question, Andrew. Okay, so our next question comes from Kieran, and it's uh, for the testicular patients you describe, how do we know the true residual cancer status? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. I, yeah, I, I probably should have said actually. Um, in the original Professor Sadberg paper from the 1990s, it's made clear that all those patients actually did have a resection. And so I guess it was confirmed from the resection whether any uh, residual cancer was found or not. Okay, brilliant. Um, next, we're going to go to Lucy. Um, so Lucy has asked, you mentioned bootstrapping for internal validation. Um, what about cross-validation or test training data sets? Oh, good. well, that's, that's another good question. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I think it could be controversial. Um, well, we're dealing with the second thing. I mean, one issue with test training sets 
is that depending on which split you do, you can get a different model. Um, you get a different uh, training set and a different test set. Um, and if you split again, it'll be different. So to some people, and I've, I've heard Frank Howell say this, that's a concern. Uh, and also if the total data set is small, then you know the, the split will be into two even smaller data sets. So you get a poorer model by estimating or training on you know, only a small part of the data, a small data set, and also a poor estimate of prediction based on a small test data set. Um, cost validation is absolutely fine. You know, I didn't mention it mainly, mainly for time, to be honest. Cost validation and bootstrapping are both completely fine. Um, the two methods have been compared, I think. I think it's been said that cost validation tends to be less biased in, in the estimate of predictions, but can have a fairly large variance, whereas bootstrapping can, you know, has a small variance, gives precise estimates, but they can be slightly biased. I think they tend to be pessimistic. But both are generally thought to be absolutely fine. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Bernard. Um, our next question is from Amar. Um, did you use an ordinary bootstrap or the FM.632 method for the internal validation? That's a, that's a good question. Thanks, Amar. Um, it, it was just the ordinary bootstrap. I mean, I, I, I do know about F1.632 method. Um, that gives an estimate of how much of the um, original data is in each bootstrap sample, given the resampling. And I know that's totally valid as well. So, I mean, that would have worked just as good and, you know, possibly better. <laughs> but, but that's a good question, Amar. Thank you. Okay, guys. Um, so I think we've covered all our questions for today so far. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank you for your uh, lovely comments as well. Um, we appreciate you joining us for our webinar today um, and taking the time on your busy schedules. Make sure to keep an eye on your inbox for the recording and a copy of the slideshow. I know a couple of people were looking for that and any future webinar dates. Um, also, if you have any further questions um, that you want to ask Bernard, please just email us at info at um, I think that's a wrap now. Thank you so much for your time and we look forward to seeing you next time.